Welcome, everyone. So good to see you out this Lord's Day. Welcome especially to our guests. We're honored that you're here. Welcome to those who will be watching later on online. Hey, a crowded airliner was just getting ready to uh, take off, um, and they're, they're doing their things. Everybody's getting seated. And this little five-year-old boy, he just lost it. And so his mom, um, and mom's trying to do all that she can. Um, she's embarrassed, you know, but it, you could tell who was really in charge, you know. Uh, but suddenly from the rear of the plane, uh, uh, an Air Force general slowly began walking up the aisle. He stopped beside the boy. He looked at mom, nodded, and gave a wink to her, and then uh, be leaned down and began to talk to the boy. And he motioned to his chest and patted the boy on the head, then eventually, and he walked away. The boy immediately just straightened up. I mean, got in his seat, began putting the seatbelt on. All the passengers around them started clapping, kind of, kind of quiet, but started clapping. And as the general was going on his way back, someone tapped him on the arm and said, excuse me, general, but what did you, what did you say to that little boy? And so he smiled and said, well, I showed him my pilot's wings. Then I showed him my service stars, my battle ribbons. And I explained to him that they entitled me to throw anyone I want out the door of any plane that I'm on. <laughs> now, it's amazing how much people will listen to someone who has the right kind of authority and who can back it up with the proper credentials. Well, we're looking at that same idea this week as we continue in our 52-week year-long quest in pursuit of Jesus. We're in week 17, and this week we'll be looking at the question, is Jesus really divine? Is Jesus really divine? The biblical concept is that of divinity. Divinity. We want, we're on a, a, a quest to get to know Jesus better, but it's not going to be head knowledge we're really looking for this year. We're looking for that relationship to actually get to know him. And if you don't have a copy, we've got plenty of them sitting on the back. Pick them up and uh, just jump right in chapter 17, and you'll be right on course with us. So the question, is Jesus divine? Really, you could rephrase it as Jesus God. Or is he just another good man? Maybe just a, a good religious teacher up with some of those other ones, you know, that the uh, history has brought forward. Um, or is he, you know, is he just an example of how to live, or a really nice guy, great leader? Or is he so much more? Let's jump into Matthew chapter 17. Um, Matthew chapter 17 comes after Matthew chapter 16. And in 16, because we got to get you on the proper timeline, because we're bouncing all over uh, with Jesus' life as we're going topically. Uh, and Matthew 16 is the journey that Jesus takes his disciples on to Caesarea Philippi. And they're in that pagan setting as he's pointing to what and showing what uh, others believe. The question arises then, uh, who do the crowd say that I am? And the disciples chime in. And then eventually Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter then, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, you are the Christ or the Messiah, the one God was sending to save his people. Uh, and then also the, he said, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus said, on that I am going to build my church. And uh, so later on in that chapter then, just a few uh, sentences later, we're told this in Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now Jesus is fully aware, you can already sense it, he's fully aware of what awaits him. He knew that he would die the most horrific, humiliating, painful death imaginable. And even though Jesus was God in the flesh, he also was fully human. He faced temptation just like you do. He uh, felt hunger just like you do. The beating that he would receive, the nails driven into his hands, hurt him just like it would hurt you. And he knew what was waiting, and he must endure it. He also knew that it would be hard for the disciples as they would watch all of that go down. And so after telling them that he must go to Jerusalem and die, he takes his inner circle. There's a couple of appearances that we see where Jesus singles out Peter, James, and John. Uh, from this point farther on, he's going to take them uh, into the garden deeper than the other disciples, and he's going to want them to be with him as he pray, prays them uh, before he's crucified. And so the same Peter, James, and John, they were the ones that were brought into the home of uh, Jairus, the synagogue leader, and uh, who had a sick daughter. And uh, they saw Jesus raise her from the dead. 
and told everyone, don't, don't get this out. This is be too much for people to handle. I will not be able to get my mission done. Basically, he's saying, don't say a word. We're going to kind of see the same thing that goes on here. Peter, James, and John go with Jesus to this high mountain by themselves. It's believed this is Mount Hermon, tallest mountain there in the north of Israel. Uh, it's the one that would fill then uh, the rivers and the streams and the River Jordan eventually uh, and, and give uh, spring, new life in the spring to that area. Uh, the promised land. And so he takes them in the high mountain by themselves and just the four of them. Jesus wanted his closest followers to see and, and knowing that they're going to have a crucial role in his ministry then later when he's gone to see where did he get his strength? Where did he uh, get his courage, his determination, and ultimately then his, his authority? And so let's look at what Matthew says. So who has their Bibles? You got your, you got your hard copies? Who's got their digital uh, ones. Okay, go ahead, fire those up. The uh, rest of you can follow along on the uh, screens in, in front of us. Look at Matthew 17. We'll begin with verse 1. After six days, six days after what? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, okay? So it's after that Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now I'm going to let Mark Moore explain why Moses would be there, why Elijah would be there, why those two in a sense. But right off the bat, I want to ask you a question. Raise your hand if you would be down for an invitation from Jesus to say, you want to go with a couple of your good buddies and go with me and let's have a mountaintop experience. All right? That's what we're looking for, right? That's what we're trying to do here, in a sense, each week. That's what the Lord's table is all about, okay? And so it's the same kind of thing. It's a special time with Jesus. And so uh, the question, though, about this, this transfiguring, this, this change, this shining like the sun, um, and then the, the special, you know, Moses and Elijah being there, who was this for? Was it for Jesus? Was it for Peter, James, and John? Was it for you and, and me? I, I think it's all the above. Jesus needed the transfiguration experience as he was preparing for the difficult road that he was uh, on his way on. Peter, James, and John, they needed it too. They, they, they were going to witness all this. They were going to be turned to uh, by, by the boys, and then ultimately uh, they wouldn't know it yet, but they're going to start the church, so they, they need this. And then let me ask you, when was the last time you had a glimpse of Jesus? For when you do, you're going to be better able to face anything that life throws at you. No matter how good things are right now at work, how good things are in your career, uh, there's going to be times ahead where you're going to have to face some difficult challenges. No matter how good your marriage is, um, there's going to be moments in the future when you're going to face some off-road moments with some rough patches that you must endure together. No matter how great things are going in your spiritual life right now, you may be as close to God as you have ever been, but there's going to be times in your future when his presence doesn't seem that close. When you struggle with sin, you struggle even with the desire to be obedient. And a fresh glimpse of Jesus will be exactly what you need. Just like soldiers who go into training at boot camp, ready for battle, then for combat, we need to get a fresh glimpse of Jesus before the next adversity hits us. Well, the story of the transfiguration is given to us to show us what we should be doing. There are some simple principles here that we can just pull easily right out of the text. You already know them, but we need to refresh them, and we need to, to go ahead and put them into practice. Here's what you need to do. Uh, first of all, number one, get alone with Jesus. You and I, we've got to get along with Jesus. Jesus goes up on this mountain. It's just him and his three closest disciples. Now, Luke's gospel, this again is in uh, a couple of different gospels. And Luke tells that Jesus let them know that they were going to go there to pray. So he wants them to be with him. When he goes to pray, then he wants to spend time alone, if you would, because uh, eventually, you, 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 I mean, you, you know, if you're with Jesus and he's praying, you know, you're just going to sit back and watch some of it. So he needs a time with the Father and the disciples. He wants them there. And I don't know how you are about this, but one of my shortcomings would be that I, I catch myself not being ready for what's next. 
that I'm not spending enough time, that even then when the situation comes, that maybe I take too long to then get alone with Jesus in the midst of it. So knowing tough times are coming, Jesus shows us we need to get away from the daily grind and get alone with him to do it often before then the storms and adversities hit. Sometimes maybe it's only a few moments that's needed. But, it, but, but we all know that there's times when it will be a season, uh, maybe a week, maybe it's a weekend, maybe, maybe just an afternoon is needed. How long, though, until you see what the disciples saw, and that is a glimpse of the glory of Jesus. The Bible says they go up on this mountain, verse 2 now, there Jesus was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. So Peter, James, and John, they saw the glory that was in Jesus. It's being revealed as if he's pulling, up, pulling back then his, his humanity and letting this glory come out. Have you seen his glory? How, how, do, how, do, you, how do you picture Jesus? That'd be fun. I, I, let's, go, let's go around. Okay, well, you guys want to start. How, how do you picture Jesus? You know, because a, a wrong picture of Jesus can hold us back from seeing him in all his glory. A number of years back, a woman in New Mexico was frying tortillas. And one of the tortillas burned, and as a result of that, there was this image that looked like a face on it. And she thought it looked like Jesus. So she took it to her priest. He thought it looked like Jesus, so he blessed it. The woman then, and her husband now, he jumps on board. Finally, you, you, you know what he was doing. No, I don't know. And then when the priest, okay, okay. So back, they go home. They take it, and they put it in this box uh, with the lid off, and they put uh, cotton around it as if it was um, floating on air in the box. They built this altar around it, and they started praying there. Well, word got out about the holy tatia, and, um, and, and soon thousands of people visited their home to pray before the holy tortilla. People are desperate to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Now, in Arkansas, a little different, okay? This time, a lady, she turned on the kitchen light in her mobile home. The reflection on the trailer next door uh, looked like a man's face. She turned it off, and the image disappeared. She turned it back on, and it came right back. And she was certain that was a miracle. She could see the face of Jesus, yes. News soon spread. Hundreds of people began visiting. They, they, they get the opportunity to come in, flip it on. <gasps> wow. You know, and because of that, crowds started coming in. Well, the local TV station showed up and interviewed one of the men that had paid a dollar. They started charging a dollar to see the image. And he was pretty skeptical. He said, I want my dollar back. It looked more like Willie Nelson to me. <laughs> the disciples got a glimpse of who Jesus really is. And they saw that he's more than a great teacher, more than a great healer, more than having power over demons. He possessed the radiance of God Almighty, and he put it on display for them. Now, in the coming days, they would need to cling to that uh, glimpse. As Jesus is arrested, taken from them then, as they see him beaten, stripped then, mocked, nailed to a cross, they would need to cling to that glimpse as they struggled with their own fears and maybe they're next. And, and, and what are we to do next? And, and look how we have failed him. I also believe the transfiguration was done for Jesus' sake too. That there was this moment that was in a sense allowed or expressed where he needed to experience again where his strength came from so that he could be prepared. He needs to get alone in God's presence, get the glimpse of the glory of God again. And he was showing them, this is where I get my strength. This is where I get my fortitude to face the challenges that lie ahead. And as you prepare for your adversity, make sure to take time out of your schedule. Get alone with God. I mean, if you're looking to get started in this routine, this is the year. Everybody say 2024. 2020, this is the year. I mean, we're being so set up with a companion guide to say, okay, you want a glimpse of Jesus? Well, yeah, 17, that's where it's talked about. Oh, look, read Mark 9, Matthew 17, look 20. And then how about Old Testament? Oh, then read this. And so just make it a part of your everyday rhythm uh, of your life, and you'll be able then uh, to, to see glimpses. Don't go to a tortilla. Don't look to a trailer. Go to the Word of God. Look at Revelation 1 and verse 12. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, John writes, the same John. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. 
And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, Jesus' favorite title for himself, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His hair, head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Sound familiar? That's how Jesus appeared on that mountain. In Exodus chapter 33, we're told that Moses asked God to let him see his glory. God told Moses, if you looked at my face, you would die instantly. So the Lord places Moses in the cleft of a rock, and his glory passed by. Now Moses was allowed to only glimpse the after, the after of God, God's glory. But, but, but that was enough. Moses came down from the mountain. His face was shining, glowing. He had to put a veil on. He was instructed by God, put a veil on that a, a, until it would wear off. And it took days and weeks for that to, to slowly disappear. Moses came down off the mountain uh, with his face shining like that. And friends, you don't have to see the glory of God with your eyes. In fact, it, you know, it would blind us. But you do have to see Jesus in all his glory with the, your eyes of faith. And you do it by opening then his word. The word will enable you to do, enable you to do a number of things. First, the word, God's word will enable us to meditate on his presence in your life. To meditate on his presence in your life. Remember that God is with you. That's the point. Jesus is with you. No matter what storm, what adversity, what, what battle you're, you're fighting, remember God said, Hebrews 11:5, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And Jesus, as he's already gone through his passion, as he has been, uh, he, he's risen from the dead, he teaches the disciples uh, for 40 days then, and the time is coming, and he, uh, as he ascends then, right before their eyes into heaven, before he does that, he tells them um, uh, that surely I'm going to be with you always to the very end of the age. I want you to go make disciples of all nations, do two things, baptizing them, name the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then he says, and remember this, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So as that same Peter, James, and John, along with the other disciples, as they go into uh, wait there in Jerusalem, power of the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they begin to offer now to mankind what God is doing in Jesus, the good news. And so what does Peter do? He stands up, and what does he say? Acts 2 and verse 38. He says, repent. These are the two gospel commands. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, uh, of Jesus Christ. For what? The forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit living in you now um, remember we're by nature we're made of spirit and we're made of, of, of our body and in, in, in our sin uh, we're dead before we come to Christ we're dead our, our spirit is dead and our body is dead and when we accept this offer from God as we are uh, repent of a, living a life uh, of our own as we turn back to God I'm going to live your way what do you want me to do immediately he says I want you baptized and so in our baptism then we, we then are uh, we connect ourselves with Jesus' death his burial and his resurrection and as we rise to new life out of the promises our sins will have been forgiven and now our spirit is made right later on uh, uh, Paul would refer to it as that the spirit now is alive it's not dead anymore our spirit's alive it's right with God but we still have these bodies of flesh that we uh, will live with until the point when our spirit separates from it. And then it will be uh, until uh, after Christ then returns, then all of us will receive glorified bodies. So it will be like, like Jesus's. But our spirit now has been made right. So it, it enables then the Holy Spirit of God. It enables Jesus to come to live within us. And, and, and we have him then within us to the point that in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, we're told, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, that's us, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, Christ in me, Christ in you, and it's the hope of glory. Now remember, biblical hope 
It's something that's yours. It's already yours. You, haven't, you don't experience it all. But we, uh, as we come out of those baptism waters, we begin to, to experience some of the glory that will ultimately be ours someday in the presence of God because the Spirit comes to live within us. And one day we'll receive the full uh, impact of that as we live uh, in the presence of God forever. So as you get along with God, remember that he's promised, I'm going to be with you with everything to the point that I'm within you. And so you don't have to fear. He's there. So meditate on his presence in your life. Second, meditate on his power in your life. That same Holy Spirit that comes within you gives you the power then to do uh, things for, 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 for the Lord. Look at Philippians 4 and verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me that strength. Uh, jump down to verse 19. And my God will meet all your needs. All your needs. You know what all means in the Greek? It means all, right? All your needs according to his glorious riches that are in Christ Jesus. And so as you are in Christ, as Christ is in you, all, uh, all, all that's needed to meet your needs are yours. That's, that's power. Romans 8 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul would write, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Song out there now, uh, popular, that, that talks about if it's not good, then uh, God's not done yet. If it's not good in your life with the, the, the storm you're facing, the adversity, just know if it's not good yet. I mean, there's a possibility you're not understanding the goodness that's in it. But, but if, you're seeing, if you're not seeing all the good yet, then God's not done. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, trek on. Just keep going. And uh, do that. know that you're doing that together uh, with, with God, who's been called to his purpose. Verse 35. And then who shall separate us then? from the love of Christ. Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or, or sword, whatever your storm is, whatever your adversity. No, verse 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. And we, and we do the conquering from the position of already being a conqueror. We're, not, we're fighting from victory, uh, not, not to, ha to have victory. We just need to know that the power is there and he is there and the victory will be ours. So when you're feeling weak and helpless, remember God is not weak and helpless. He's all powerful, has all the wherewithal to do what, he, uh, what needs to be done. So meditate at his power, uh, on his power that's at work in your life. And then thirdly, meditate on his purpose in your life. His purpose in your life. The adversity you face is not meaningless. Jesus didn't face the cross simply because things just got out of hand. No, there's a purpose there. Jesus was working his way there. There, uh, there is a reason for his suffering, and there's also a reason for your suffering too. God is doing a work in your life. Storms are going to come. Uh, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to have enough trouble of its own, Jesus said. This is a necessary chapter in your life. Look at 1 Peter 1 and verse 6. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer in grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, it, can you think anything bigger? I mean, today, uh, greater than Bitcoin, greater than what, what I don't know, um, plutonium, who knows? I mean, whatever. Uh, so here's the highest speaker, greater than anything you can imagine. And all that's going to perish, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So before or at least at the onset of a storm in your life, get along with Jesus. Get a glimpse of his glory. Meditate on his presence in your life, his power in, his li in your life, and his purpose at work in your life. Secondly then, uh, how do we get a glimpse of Jesus? Listen to Jesus. Listen to him. When Peter got that glimpse of glory, what did he say? Verse 4, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Uh, no, 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 no. I like how Luke comments in his uh, description of the event. He says this about Peter, Luke 9, verse 33. Peter didn't know what he was saying. And can you imagine? I mean, it's more than any of us can comprehend. And, and in a sense, then, the, the no, no, no is Jesus is not equal with Moses and Elijah. You just don't treat them all the, the same. And by the way, we're not staying here. So Peter gets ahead of God. Uh, he's probably thinking, hey, worship. I'm going to worship, worship as long as I can. I don't want this moment to go away. You said you're going to die, and, and I, I don't want to watch that. Let's stay here forever. And he's got a point. 
I mean, how many of you have been in a week of camp where you just don't want to go home? Or you've been on a retreat, or you went to a conference, or there was a moment in a study that, that you just like, you, you're on the mountain, and, and you, just, you just don't, you want it to last, to last forever. I mean, the phone's not ringing, no interruptions, no one's bickering with each other. It's, it's like getting a little closer to heaven while we're here on earth. But we're called to live in the day in and the day out grind of this real world. Peter's idea may have sounded good to him, but he didn't have God's perspective on the situation, so God got his attention. Notice Jesus didn't answer. It's the Father. Look at verse 5. While, Jesus, while Peter is, was, was still speaking, excuse me, no, I'm sorry. Yes, while Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cl cl uh, cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples, verse 6 tells us, heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. I like how pastor and author Max Lucado described this. He said, this is the fear of the Lord. This, this, this dropping face down to the ground. Most of our fears are poisonous. They steal sleep and they pillage peace. But this fear is different. From a biblical perspective, there's nothing neurotic about fearing God. The neurotic thing is to not be afraid or to be afraid of the wrong things. That is why God chooses to be known to us so that we may stop being afraid of the wrong thing. When God is fully revealed to us and we get it, then we experience the conversion of our fear to the fear of the Lord. This is the deeply sane recognition that we are not God. How long, then, he asks, since you felt this fear? Since a fresh understanding of Christ buckled your knee, knees and emptied your lungs, since a glimpse of him left you speechless and breathless, it's been a while. If it's been a while, that explains your fears. When Christ is great, fears are not. As all of Jesus expands, fears of life diminish. A big God translates into big courage. Small view of God generates no courage. A limp, puny, fireless Jesus has no power over cancer cells, corruption, identity theft, stock market crashes, or global calamity. A packageable, portable Jesus might feel well in a purse or up on a shelf, but it does nothing for your fears. This must be why Jesus took the disciples up the mountain. He saw the box in which they had confined him. He saw the future that awaited them, the fireside denial of Peter, prisons of Jerusalem and Rome, the demands of the church later, and the persecutions of Nero. A box-sized version of God simply would not work. So Jesus blew the sides out of their preconceptions. May he blow the sides out of ours, he ends. Now, right after God told Peter, James, and John to listen to Jesus, what was the next, very next thing Jesus said to them? Well, two things. Look at verse 7. He came and Jesus touched them and said, Get up, don't be afraid. Get up, don't be afraid. So if when you face adversity... You know, when we do it, we, we kind of want to cower and, and be overcome with fear. But Jesus tells his disciples, and he tells us today, get up and don't be afraid. What you're about to face, it may be tough, but you're not all alone. I am with you. You know, many times before we face a storm, we start crying out, God, get me out of this. Don't let this happen. Get me out of this. And often his response is, I I'm not going to get you out of this, my child but I'm going to get you through it. So get up and don't be afraid. When you take the time to listen to God, you then have a chance to filter out all those excuses that you're already thinking of, all those escape routes you might have wanted to take, and, and you uh, have this chance then to listen to that still, small voice, the gentle voice of encouragement from God that says, get up and don't be afraid. You can do this. We can do this. I'm going to be with you. So get along with Jesus. Open up your heart to him. 
Open your eyes, open your ears. And then number three, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Don't follow the experience. Follow him. I want to hear any more about how camp is so awesome. I want to hear about how awesome Jesus is or how awesome that uh, retreat was um, or that Bible study. You, you, you talk about, you experience how awesome Jesus is. Now, what does following Jesus look like according to this passage? Well, where does Jesus lead Peter, James, and John after this moment? Well, one thing Jesus doesn't do, he doesn't lead them from mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop, blowing their minds with all these signs, all these wonders, you know. He just starts walking them back down into the valley. He leads his disciples into the valley of the ordinary, the normative, the mundane, the sometimes unmiraculous. And from there, he leads them then eventually to the Garden of Gethsemane, where they watch him sweat drops of blood. Then he leads them to the hill called Calvary or Golgotha, so that they can watch him die, the cruelest, most horrible death. Only then does he lead them to the resurrection, inviting them into the kingdom of heaven. The Christian life following Christ is not to move from glory to glory to glory, from mountaintops to mountaintops, though there may be moments we get a couple of those together, but then uh, we're going to have to, you know, we got work to do. We, we got a person to follow, Jesus. There's needs all around us that he wants to use us to meet. We've got things we still need to learn, and all of that happens in the valley. So where will your valley be this week? this month, or even this year? Is it to dig deeper into a marriage that is beginning to unravel? Is it to uh, be more of a light at work, to minister to people that you really don't care for uh, and, and you don't have much in common with at all? Is it to get involved in the life of a neighbor? What will it be? Verse 9, they were told, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man, again, his favorite title, has been raised from the dead. Jesus reminds them that there will be a resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection. You notice that? When he is raised from the dead, not, you know, when I go to the cross. No, when I'm raised from the dead. He's saying it's true. I'm going to face adversity. I am going to be killed. Not the end of the story. There's going to be a resurrection. I'll be raised from the dead. Wait until then. And so as you face adversity, the same is true for you. The story's not going to end in your storm. The story doesn't end with defeat. It's going to end with victory. You'll have to face some trials, some tribulations, but on the other side of all of those is a resurrection that has your name on it. In preparing for adversity, we must then ready ourselves to wait it out, to battle it through until victory comes. So you wait on God. I'm not trying to be a doomsday prophet to say adversity and storms are around the corner. Um, it's just a fact of life. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, but if we're prepared, the battle that, that we're, we're in, we're sure to win it. So how do we prepare? Again, get along with Jesus until you get, get a glimpse of his glory, until you're confident of his presence, his power, and his purpose in your life. Get along with Jesus and listen to Jesus until you get his perspective on what's happening to you. Until you hear these encouraging words, my child, my son, my daughter, get up. Don't be afraid. Get along with Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Follow Jesus. Wait out the storm. Do your battle. There's a new day that will come, and there's going to be a resurrection. Now, this amazing story ends saying Luke 9 now. Uh, Matthew just ends abruptly. Luke goes on with a little bit. After verse thir uh, in verse 36, he tells us, when the voice uh, of God had spoken, they found that Jesus now is all of a sudden alone when it ended, when the voice had stopped uh, of the Father. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Good job, guys, right? I think they needed time to process that experience. It, it was too majestic, too, too much for them to really uh, to be able to grasp, even begin to tell about it. Peter would tell about it. He, he writes, we have this evidence, 2 Peter 1 and verse 16, for we, talking about the, the disciples, we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were witnesses of his majesty. 
he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. In other words, Peter's saying, we didn't make this up. We're eyewitnesses. We saw Jesus. We had a glimpse of what heaven will be a little bit like. And you can see it too. C.S. Lewis, you remember, he's the one who had the Chronicles of Narnia series, but in that opening, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he introduced us to a, a Jesus figure, a lion that was named Aslan. Now, in a book that was written later, about later on in their, their journey, um, if you would, named Prince Caspian, that book, Lucy then, that little girl then, she sees Aslan, the lion, again. But this is for the first time in many years. He's changed since their last encounter. His size surprises her, and she tells him as much by saying, Aslan, uh, you're bigger. And he responded, that is because you are older, little one. Not because you are. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And so it is with, with Christ. Max Lucado will write that the longer we live in Jesus, the greater he becomes in us. It's not that he changes, but that we do. We see more of him. We see dimensions, aspects, characteristics we never saw before. Increasing and astonishing increments of his purity, his power, his uniqueness. We discard boxes, these old images of Christ, like used tissues. We don't dare place Jesus on a political donkey or an elephant. Arrogant certainty becomes meek curiosity. Define Jesus with a doctrine? Confine him to an opinion? By no means. We'll sooner capture the Caribbean in a butterfly net than we'll capture Christ in a box. In the end, we respond like the apostles. We too fall on our faces and we worship. And when we do, the hand of the carpenter extends through the tongue of towering fire and touches us. Arise, do not be afraid. Then he says this. Here's my hunch. Peter, James, and John descended the mountain, sunburned, <laughs> smiling with a spring in their step, if not a slight swagger. With a Messiah like this one, who could hurt them? Here's my other hunch he finishes with. Mount Hermon's still ablaze and has space for guests. And then I say, ask you of this, when will you be next? Let's pray. Father, for another glimpse into the life of Jesus that you had recorded for us, we're truly thankful. But oh, for oh, how it, it, it points us to who you really are. And Father, we ask your forgiveness when we fall so short, when we rely too much on our own flesh, our own fears. And so we pray that you would give us a fresh glimpse of Jesus, not only today, but till the day you call us home. Help us to have a hunger and a thirst for it over and over again. And may it empower us then to be on mission for you, not only to straighten our lives up, to be worthy of the call that we've individually received, but that we would be better uh, recipients, uh, better conduits of ones who your grace and your mercy could flow through then to others, that they might be blessed, that they may see Christ lifted up high that they may get a glimpse themselves that brings them within the family. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen. For um, those of you who know, don't know me very well, um, I work at a shop down in Litchfield, and uh, we repair hydraulics down there. A while back, we had an unusual request to do an on-site repair at a steel mill. So after I got there, um, got to the job site, I realized that this is the dirtiest place that I've ever worked in. 
I couldn't believe it. And, and the work that I had to do, I kind of had to reach up underneath, so I had to lie down, and I was just wallowing in the oil and the mill dust. And anyway, um, I got the repairs done. The steel mill was very happy with me, and they was very happy with the results. And we made some pretty good bank. So, um, but when I got home that, that night, I, I came in through the garage, and I stuck my clothes off. I, I threw them in the garbage can, because I am done with those. I uh, went straight to the shower, got cleaned up, put on some new clothes, and it was just so good to be home. Couldn't hardly wait for Robin to ask me how my day went, because boy, did I have a story to tell. <laughs> Becoming a Christian is it's a lot like that day at work. When you realize what a dark and dirty place that this world has become since the fall, and then you, you admit that I, I'm just wallowing here in my sin and I'm covered in filth, and then you come to the point where you admit that, that very thing, and, and it doesn't matter you know, how happy people are with you or the job that you do here, or how much money you make, you got to get cleaned up to be at home with the Lord. You have to take off that old self, and you got to be done with it. And then you go straight into the baptismal water, and you come out cleansed of all your sins. And now you're rising up to a new life, and you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, eager to tell your story. The only way that any of this is possible is because of that little cup of juice and the tiny cracker that we're about to receive. It's the body and blood of Jesus that cleans us up, so to speak, when we receive him as Lord. Now, if you've done a lot of wrong things, I get that, and some really bad things, and you might be thinking that God will never forgive me. You don't get to decide that. Our infinite God that created all that there is, and then he sent his son to the cross as payment for your sin debt for those very things. See, he's the point of reference for all our morality. He decides if the blood of Christ covers your piddling little sins that probably a thousand people have committed before you. The blood of Christ is far powerful enough to do that. And if you're living the new life and you're clothed in righteousness and you're still falling to sin, it seems like you just can't stop that one certain thing. Well, just ask God for help. You know, if he loves you enough to send his son, he will help you to overcome the sin. Let's pray. Lord, we, um, we do look forward to coming home to you how good it will be to never fall into sin again. Thank you for the blessing of hope that comes through Christ. We um, pray for opportunities to tell others how that we have come to this, to this hope that we have. Lord, use this church in a mighty way, and we're going to give you the glory. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen.